Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Dan uh, salam sejahtera tuan-tuan dan puan-puan sekalian Saya ingin membentangkan prestasi pertumbuhan ekonomi negara Pada suku ketiga tahun 2016 Pada sidang akhbar pada hari ini Seperti biasa perangkaan pertumbuhan ekonomi ini telah disediakan Oleh Jabatan Perangkaan Malaysia Taklimat ini juga merangkumi perkembangan moneteri dan keuangan. Ekonomi negara mencatatkan pertumbuhan sebanyak 4.3% pada suku ketiga dan terus disokong oleh permintaan dalam negeri. Ini berbanding dengan prestasi pertumbuhan sebanyak 4% pada suku tahun kedua 2016. Ekonomi negara kekal berdaya saing dalam menghadapi cabaran-cabaran global dan domestik Daya saing dan daya tahan ini disokong oleh beberapa faktor Pertama, sumber pertumbuhan ekonomi yang pelbagai Kedua, pertumbuhan upah dan guna tenaga yang mantap Dan ketiga, pelaksanaan projek-projek infrastruktur yang berterusan Ladies and gentlemen The global economy experienced moderate growth in the third quarter of the year while global trade activity remained subdued. The advanced economies continued to register modest improvement. Despite persistent weaknesses in export performances in Asia, economic activity expanded at a more moderate pace supported by domestic demand. While uncertainty over global growth prospect remained high, Several major and regional central banks have increased the degree of monetary accommodation. This has co contributed to the lower financial market volatility during the quarter. The Malaysian economy expanded by 4.3% in the third quarter of 2016. This is due mainly to the continued expansion in the private sector demand with some support from the improvement in net exports. On the domestic front, Private sector expenditure remained the key driver of growth. In particular, the stronger growth in private consumption reflects the strength and resilience of the economy. The exports, net exports provided some support to growth, rising from the effects of decline in import outweigh the contraction in export growth. On the supply side, growth was supported by the major economic sectors mainly by services and manufacturing, while the agriculture sector remained weak. Growth in the services sector was driven largely by consumption-related services, underpinned by continued growth in household spending. The manufacturing sector growth was sustained, supported mainly by the export-oriented industries, particularly primary-related production and semiconductors under the electronic segment. Growth in the construction sector was underpinned by the civil engineering subsector following progress in large petrochemical, transport and utility projects. In the mining sector, growth improved, supported by higher crude oil production, particularly in Sabah. Growth in the agriculture sector remained in contraction as the lack impact of El Nino on crude palm oil yields continued to affect production. Private sector activity, as most of you know, remained the anchor of growth. It now constitutes about 72% of the overall GDP. Private sector consumption, private consumption registered a stronger growth of 6.4%. That number was 6.3% in the second quarter of 2016. Private investment grew by 4.7%, supported by continued capital spending in the services and manufacturing sectors. On household spending, it was supported by continued growth in wages, in part by the increase in minimum wage and the salary adjustment for civil servants. Aggregate wages in the manufacturing sector and wholesale and retail services subsectors grew at a stronger pace of 6%. Employment continued to expand in the third quarter of 2016 with a net gain of 41,000 jobs. 
Nonetheless, employment gains are slightly lower than the growth of new entrants into the workforce, causing the unemployment rate to age higher to 3.5%. Slower job gains were reflective of the cautious business sentiment as firms decide to maintain their headcounts and delay in hiring in the current environment. It should be noted that these retrenchments are not generalised but rather industry-specific in nature. Layoff has been limited to three industries, particularly the E&E, oil and gas and the banking sector, involving 20,000 workers or 64% of total layoff during the year. However, these sectors only employ about 19% of the total workforce in Malaysia. On inflation, headline inflation moderated further to 1.3% in the third quarter of 2016. The moderation reflected mainly supply-related factors. Inflation in the food and non-alcoholic beverages category was lower at 3.4%. This was mainly due to an increase in the supply of vegetables, fish and seafood following an improvement in the weather condition. Inflation in the transport category also registered a larger decline of minus 7.4% in the third quarter of 2016, due mainly to larger increase in the prices of RON 97 and RON 95 petrol during the base period of the third quarter of 2015. Core inflation remained relatively stable in the third quarter of 2016 at 2%. Turning to the external sector, the current account recorded a higher surplus of 6 billion ringgit or 2% of GNI in the third quarter of 2016. The surplus was supported by higher goods sur surplus amid larger services and primary income deficit. Good surplus were mainly supported by an improvement in commodity exports and weaker import performance. During the quarter, Export demand for most major commodities and price of crude oil improved. Deficit in the services account was higher, due mainly to higher payment for personal, cultural and recreational services, construction in oil and gas related projects and outbound tourism, due to travelling for the Hajj and participation in international sport events. Primary income deficit widened as in <coughs> investment income accrued to foreign investors in Malaysia remained large, while income accrued to Malaysian firms were lower. Secondary income deficit was smaller, due mainly to lower outward remittances by foreign workers. As at 31st of October 2016, the, our international trade amounted to $97.8 billion. This represents a $4.5 billion increase from $93.3 billion as at end of September 2015. External debt amounted to $865 billion ringgit or 70% of GDP during the quarter. About 60% of the external debt is of medium and long-term tenure, suggesting no immediate repayment requirements. Close to 40% of external debt is denominated in ringgit and is not subjected to valuation effects. On the other hand, the foreign currency denominated external debt is likely hedged and backed by external assets. Let me touch a bit on the ringgit. In the third quarter, the ringgit depreciated against most of the major and regional currencies and retraced some of the appreciation in the first half of 2016. Overall, the ringgit NEER and REER also depreciated by 3.4% and 2.4% respectively. The ringgit depreciation was a reflection of the shift in investor sentiment and portfolio investment throughout the quarter, driven large, mainly by continued volatility in global crude oil prices and uncertainty over the timing of the US interest rate normalization. Moving forward, the ringgit will continue to face volatility. 
due mainly to uncertainties in the external environment. Expectation of another increase by Federal Reserve at the upcoming December meeting continue to affect investors' sentiment and uncertainties over new policy initiative under the new newly elected president. Despite recent strength, global crude oil prices expected to remain volatile due to uncertain supply and demand condition, especially given the upcoming OPEC meeting at the end of November. Uncertainty surrounding China economic outlook and RMB development is also a concern. Another is geopolitical risk, particularly with regards to risk associated with Brexit. The increasing flexibility of the ringgit in recent years have accorded the necessary buffer to the Malaysian economy, and this is a very important point. In fact, most regional currencies are experiencing volatility if you look at the development uh, elsewhere. This increasing flexibility of the ringgit is a reflection of the maturity of the Malaysian economy and the financial system. Malaysia's economy has become more diversified and resilient. Our financial market has become deeper with broader set of players. We have accumulated strong buffers in the form of ample international reserve. These fundamental changes in the economy have allowed the ringgit to be more flexible in absorbing external shock to the economy. Going forward, the ringgit will continue to be market determined. The bank's role is to continue managing extreme volatilities in the ringgit with no targeted level or predetermined path. Let me touch on the holding of our Malaysian government bond. The resident holding of Malaysian government bonds remain relatively stable, hovering around 34% of the outstanding value of government bonds of 208 billion as at end of September 2016. The majority of the investors in the Malaysian government bond are long-term investors, mainly asset managers, central banks, government and pension funds. On the monetary policy, the OPR was maintained at 3% at our September MPC meeting after the adjustment in July. As monetary policy is forward-looking, the OPR reduction in July was preemptive given the assessment on the economic outlook then. The adjustment was to ensure that the level of OPR was consistent with achieving a steady growth path and stable inflation. In September, the OPR was left unchanged as this level of policy rate was assessed to remain consistent with the intended policy stance given the latest economic assessment. For the future policy, the MPC will assess the balance of risk surrounding the domestic and inflation outlook based on the most up-to-date information available. Let's look at the intermediation role. Net financing for the banking system, development financial institution and the corporate bond market expanded by 6.5% as at September 2016. While outstanding banking and DFI loans grew at a slower pace of 4.3% as at end of September, gross financing to the private sector through banking system, DFI and capital market was sustained at 293 billion ringgit during the quarter. Financial institutions continue to support the growth of SMEs. Financing to the SMEs grew by 8.2% year on year to 290 billion ringgit as at end of third quarter 2016. SME financing comprised almost half of the total business financing by the financial institution. Financing outstanding of scheme Pembiayaan Micro grew by 4.8% year on year to 940 million ringgit, benefiting more than 66,000 micro enterprises. On house financing, it has expanded by 10% in third quarter of 2016. This account for 51.8% of banking system loans to the household sector or about 30% of the banking system total loans. Eligible borrowers continue to assess bank financing including the purchase of houses. In the third quarter of 2016, the banking institution approved 87,000 number of 
application or 75% of application received totaling 24 billion ringgit. Housing loan rejection stood at 24% and mainly reflected affordability issues. At present, there are 2.3 million borrowers of housing loan. Of these, 74% of the borrowers are first-time owners of home prices below 500,000 ringgit. In the housing market, house prices increased at a slower pace of 7% in the first quarter of 2016, continuing the moderating trend since the peak of 12.2% in third quarter of 2013. While prices have moderated in recent quarters, the growth rate remained above the long-term average of 5.5%. Despite the present prevalent issue of housing affordability, Malaysia's home ownership rate of 76% is still one of the highest globally, if you look at the chart on the right-hand side. Nevertheless, efforts are in place to ensure continued access to financing for eligible borrowers, raise the supply of affordable housing, and to facilitate a well-functioning rental market. Domestic financial stability remained preserved. This was supported by financial system resilience, orderly functioning of domestic financial markets, and confidence in the financial system. The banking system is well capitalized. With strong capital buffers, banks are in a <coughs> comfortable position to respond to challenges from tougher business and operating conditions. At the end of September, banks have more than 120 billion ringgit of excess capital buffers. The insurance industry is equally well capitalized, with capital buffers amounting to 35 billion ringgit. There are ample liquidity within the Malaysian banking system to support bank financing activities. Aggregate surplus liquidity, including statutory reserve requirements, place with the Bank Negara Malaysia remain high at 182 billion ringgit. Banks also maintain a high liquidity coverage ratio of 127% to meet unexpected cash outflows or adverse liquidity shocks. This is well above our regulatory requirement. Domestic funding condition was stable during the quarter. Average cost of deposit for banks was unchanged at 2.62% while the three-month CLIBOR eased to 3.4%. While banks' funding structure is predominantly deposit-based, issuances of medium-term funding instruments have contributed towards reducing maturity and currency mismatches in bank funding structures. These measures is more reflective of banks' broader funding base. At the end of the quarter, the loan-to-fund ratio stood at 83.4%. The banking credit risk exposure to business remain manageable. Aggregate debt servicing capacity of Malaysian business remain intact. The overall asset quality of banks' business portfolio remains sound despite higher delinquencies and impairment in the construction and manufacturing sectors. The supply of credit to businesses has been supportive with limited evidence of a broad-based tightening by banks and sustain investors' interest in the domestic capital market. Total debt businesses grew by 3.7% on an annual basis, driven mainly by higher fund raised from the capital market. Growth in outstanding bank financing to SME remained at a robust 8.5%. So this is a very important aspect for our economy to grow forward. We want to make sure that intermediation role remain smooth. The outlook for the oil and gas sector remain weak. However, the risk to banking system is limited given the small exposure of only 2.1% of banking system loans and corporate bonds holding. Let me touch a bit on the data relating to household. Household debt sustained a slower growth momentum increasing by 5.8% at the end of the third quarter. Growth in household financial assets picked up during the quarter. This led to sustaining household financial buffers at two times of debt. Stable income and labour market condition continued to provide support for adjustment by most households to rising costs, 
particularly those living in the urban areas. This has sustained the quality of household loans and low delinquencies. The ratio of impaired and delinquent household loans remain low at 1.6% and 1.5% of total household borrowing, respectively. An increasing issue that has attracted a lot of attention is on cyber threat. So we have a few points to raise at this uh, press conference. We give a lot of uh, attention on this particular subject. Uh, the central bank requires financial institutions to implement strong risk management and security control against cyber threat. The central bank issued various guidelines to strengthen financial institution cyber security. As an industry-wide review commenced in March 2016, where financial institutions, including payment system operators, were required to conduct self-assessment on their IT, security and risk management control and identify further improvement in line with the best practices such as SWIFT recommended security controls. With effect from January 2018, SWIFT will publish financial institution compliance status with its newly introduced mandatory security control. This will foster market discipline in adhering to recommended best practice. So this is a good development so that uh, all the banks around the globe will adopt best practices. In addition, industry level working groups are established to share cyber threat intelligence and facilitate timely coordinated action to mitigate risk of cyber threats. The working groups are participated by financial institution, Cybersecurity Malaysia, Malaysia Communication and Multimedia Commission, and the Royal Malaysian Police to facilitate a coordinated industry response to any cyber threats. Let me conclude. Although economic activity in Malaysia is currently relatively subdued, growth is expected to improve as policy measures gain traction and global prospect improve. Malaysia's current resilience in withstanding challenges in the global and domestic environment is underpinned by diversified sources of growth and export market, steady wage and employment, and ongoing implementation of infrastructure projects. Malaysia continues to be an attractive investment destination, <coughs> underpinned by developed and sound financial system. Downside risks continue to be mitigated by sufficient buffers, adequate policy space, and high state of readiness. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I end my presentation. But there are uh, a few things that uh, I want to announce. Uh, first is that uh, Bank Negara Malaysia will introduce a newly redesigned website, uh, which is more intuitive, efficient and user-friendly. The refresh corporate look and feel is complemented with relevant pages to better highlight new messages and uh, content. Uh, you can easily access this information uh, via our website and we also have done an improved mobile browsing experience through responsive design features which will make it adaptable to smartphones and also tablets. This create a convenient and engaging browsing experience for the users of the tablet and uh, smartphone. Uh, the new website will be available starting from Monday the 14th, uh, next Monday. With that, uh, thank you very much.